Welcome to C++ Club. This is meeting 163, and today is the 13th of July 2023. There was a bit of a pause in, in meetings uh, first. Uh, you probably heard Apple had a developer conference, so I sort of got into the rabbit hole of watching their videos. And then I accidentally, accidentally, he says, installed uh, their beta OS on my working machine, which is never a good idea. And turns out that it broke everything that's related to video, including Zoom. So I decided as a, a completely sensible person to wait until another beta refresh in two weeks. And that broke it even, even worse. So then I spent the whole weekend restoring the previous version and I'm fine now. So I thought uh, we'd start uh, with a bit of warm-up, uh, a small set of smaller topics. This is uh, Bartomei Filipek uh, wrote a blog post. It's quite old, actually, but uh, still useful. These are all major C++ 17 features. For those of us uh, who are still on C++ 17, like myself at work, and it's a very useful blog post in the sense that it just assembles all the main features. And what's uh, even more useful is that each new feature lists compiler compatibility, uh, compiler support uh, for that particular feature. Admittedly, it's a bit outdated. Uh, it's, um, what is it, uh, when it was written? October last year, okay, it's it's quite a bit outdated. So the compiler support has much improved since then, but um, still I thought it was a useful resource if you needed a quick refresh. This is a Reddit thread about it, and the first comment is, please, the same, but for C++20. So hopefully Bartome will do that soon, if he hadn't already and I missed it, and hopefully for C++23 as well. Next is a learning resource from JetBrains. The JetBrains Academy blog posted a new course, C++ for Beginners, build a 2D arcade game from scratch. And it's a guided uh, free course for anyone who is starting with C++. Programming games is how many people start with C++. So yeah, that's a useful starting point where you can immediately see the results, which is nice. A new version of C-Lion is out. What what, what does the, what do they use for uh, graphics? Oh, good question. Hang on. Uh, I don't know. I'll clarify that for the next time. It's, I'm guessing, most likely maybe SDL or some other game-oriented graphics library. It's always the, uh, the the sort of stumbling block for novices starting to learn C++. It's installing some, choosing some system, installing it and getting uh, the graphical hello world to work. Yeah, uh, I'll see if I can try it out and, and see what it's about in more detail. Uh, this is their blog about a new release of Sea Lion 2023.1. Uh, there are uh, debugger updates, uh, support more support for Qt uh, modeling language, integration for uh, with VC package uh, package manager, a better terminal emulation, better C++ support, and all kinds of other improvements. Now you can even see disassembly in your IDE, which can be really useful if you're hunting for a bug or trying to optimize heavily. It's like uh, Godbolt in your IDE. Uh, this is a blog post with some other links like um, Qt Creator, for example, which is another free IDE that you can use even, even if you don't use Qt. That might be the answer to my previous question. A new feature in Visual Studio is available 
which is called Build Insights. It's now integrated in Visual Studio 2022. Build Insights is based on instrumentation and tooling that has had been available earlier with VCPerf uh, build profiler. Basically, it uses Windows profiling architecture to pr produce timings for your build and point you to anything that consumes a lot of time during the build so that you can concentrate on optimizing it to keep your build times sane. I tried using VCPerf, the previous incarnation, at work, but unfortunately, it conflicts with some... What it, what it tries to do when you start it is set up a new profiling session at the system level. And even if you have admin permissions, which I've got just for that uh, particular executable, it complains about some other process currently running some sort of system trace. And I suspect this is some, I don't know, um, corporate thing that can, can't be disabled. So I'm wondering if this feature being integrated in Visual Studio uh, will work better in that environment. Somehow um, they hadn't thought of that, which is weird. I bet Microsoft also runs some sort of corporate uh, tracing program on their PCs. But um, yeah, that's an issue for me. Right. Next one is, um, yeah, that's the Reddit post. Next is documentation related. There is a tool, I think it's uh, originally by Adobe, it's called HDoc. It's a source documentation tool that produces very nice uh, documentation websites, basically statically generated documentation about your code. I think it can consume the same tags as Doxygen or close to it. And I think it we'll be lost without our 90s looking documentation <laughs> automatically generated from Doxygen. Actually, Doxygen has nice uh, post processes now. Uh, you can find tools that modify the resulting HTML and make it very nice looking and, and modern. Some, some of those tools even include uh, an efficient search. But this uh, documentation is especially nice. So that might be an option. I think you can host it yourself and they also provide some sort of paid hosting for your documentation if you are willing to open it to the world. <laughs> now, this is interesting. This is one of the uh, bigger topics, although not as big as the next one, secret. Um, float zone. I only read about it uh, a couple of days ago. This is a new iteration of a memory and address sanitizer, which is much more efficient than the existing ASAN. It's a red zone based memory sanitizer to efficiently detect buffer overflows and use after freeze by means of floating point underflows. It's it's just genius. They provide the entire paper um, about this, but this website is like a summary. Basically what they do is, um, let me quote from the paper, I think, quote, we introduce float zone, a compiler based sanitizer to detect spatial and temporal memory errors in C slash C++. <laughs> I, need to, I need to have a sort of a jingle uh, a ping when I, I read this. Let's, let's not make slash. it into a drinking game. <laughs> yeah. uh, programs using lightweight checks that leverage the floating point unit, FPU. We show that the combined effect of lookup, compare, and branch can be achieved with a single floating point addition that triggers an underflow exception in, in the case of a memory violation. 
Our evaluation shows that Float Zone significantly outperforms existing systems with just 37% runtime overhead. As far as I can remember, ASUN is roughly twice as slow. And then they go on with explaining this. Quote, on every load and store, ASUN looks up the corresponding metadata, compares it to see if it is part of a red zone, uh, like a special memory zone set aside to detect um, uh, out-of-bound writes, and branches to exit code that raises an alarm if this is the case. The branch instruction pollutes the branch predictor and contends with the application for CPU execution units. The key insight in this paper is that sanitizer checks never fail in the normal case and should add little overhead except in the event of a violation of memory safety. In an ideal world, the sanitizer should use a special fast instruction that is branchless, does not contend with the application for CPU execution units, and checks the validity of memory implicitly, raising an exception upon a violation. While modern CPUs lack such a targeted instruction, we will show that they do have instructions that approximate exactly this behavior. In particular, they say, we find that a floating point addition can be made to generate an exception if it processes red zone data. We achieve this by configuring a single floating point addition to result in an underflow exception only if one of the operands is equal to our red zone poison value. This is just genius. Uh, the quote continues, by instrumenting vulnerable loads stores with the addition, we ensure that red zone accesses raise an alarm. Moreover, the addition is fast and branchless and executes on an execution unit that is underutilized in most programs, which is FPU. As a result, the solution ensures high instruction level parallelism in much better performance than prior techniques. And in the paper, they demonstrate that they found a specific value, a quote from the website, with a magic number in hexadecimal OX 0B, 8B, 8B, 8A. We can implement a branchless equality check with one of the fastest operation uh, the process can execute, a floating point addition. This number has un the unique property that when added to all the possible floating point values, it, it causes an exception only with two of them. And so if you poison uh, your area with these values, one of them is used for the start of the uh, area and the rest is filled with the other one, it sort of automatically produces a, an underflow if that's one of the operands. There are pictures to illustrate this and it's just mind-blowingly cool. <laughs> I wonder when... Sounds a bit hacky. Did they, did they try many platforms to make sure this works? Well, <laughs> uh, fair question. I think it's currently only implemented for Clang and only on Linux. But on the other hand, uh, currently, at least at work, I only use um, sanitizers on Linux and um, Clang is one of them. So even if they don't do it in GCC, still it would be a, a, a good improvement. But according to them, it should work on all x86 platforms, AMD, Intel, and... Yeah, I think that's that's independent. Actually, there is a, a test implementation. So this is the PDF of the paper. It's not very long. And um, this is a, an implementation uh, on GitHub. They implemented it in LLVM, I think. And um, just trying to look at what uh, platforms they support. I think it's just LLVM by now at, at, at the moment because they they used it to just uh, it's probably was probably easier than gcc to uh play around most definitely so yeah that's a very interesting progress and um i'm, I'm going to be watching it because that that's going to improve things with sanitization now on to the main topic uh vana iso c plus plus committee trip reports 
so this is the uh, Reddit post by Inbal Levy. Uh, she always produces very detailed reports from, from all the conferences and um, meetings. And so we've got a lot of new C++ 26 features. And um, she lists all those that were voted in. So uh, let's quickly go through them. This paper, P2558, add ampersand dollar sign and backtick to the basic character set. This is approved for C++26. Currently, it's approved for C23. And so C++ will mirror that with uh, these being part of the uh, source character set. Um, hashing support for std chrono value classes. Gets useful. This next paper, P2562, context per stable sorting. Um, it's probably always good to have more context per algorithms. Function ref. A type erased callable reference. This is by Vittorio Romeo and others. Um, I seem to remember it's been long in the making. And so now it's yes, going to be. Yes. Yeah. And so now it's going to be in 26. Uh, right. Uh, this paper, P2641, checking if a union alternative is active. Previously, if you accessed an inactive alternative uh, that would result in undefined behavior. But uh, I think this provides a, a way to detect uh, which one is active. And it's evaluated as a context, as context bar. Hmm, yeah, useful. Another one related to function um, pointers and wrappers. P2548, copyable function. I do have already, I think it's in 23 maybe, move only function. So mm -hmm. this is a, a copyable one. Presumably it's going to be still more efficient than std function. <laughs> and hopefully it's going to work well with function ref. Yeah. Uh, there's a sub MD span. Paper P2630, uh, MD span has also been long in the making. Uh, luckily, we do have it in uh, 23, I think. So this is like, all right, uh, they say sub MD span was removed uh, from MD span paper for it to be included in 23. So this is just re addition of um, reintroduction of sub MD span. Uh, this is a curious one. P2621. UB in my Lexa by Corentin Jabot. The abstract says, quote, the mere act of lexing C++ can result in undefined behavior. This paper removes that undefined behavior. And that's weird. I didn't know that. The example is, you've probably seen this one where the source code uses a continuation backslash character and then does all sorts of weird uh, manipulations using the backslash splitting uh, the statement over several lines and basically it's sort of an artificial thing but still if it can produce UB or another example uh, he lists is an unterminated string. So if you write const char star foo equals opening double quote and don't close it, it can cause undefined behavior. Unevaluated strings, D2361. I'm not sure why some papers have P and others have D. Different kind of paper. So this is D2361, unevaluated strings. Quote, string literals can appear in a context where they are not used to initialize a character array, but are used at compile time for diagnostic messages, pre-processing, and other implementation-defined behaviors. This paper clarifies how compilers should handle these things. 
Mm, yeah, fair enough. Uh, some void star casting thing. So this is paper P2738. Constexpo cast from void star towards Constexpo type erasure. And the abstract is, we propose to allow a limited form of casting from void star to support type erasure in Constexpo. Yeah, sure. Timo Dumler has this paper P2552 on the ignorability of standard attributes. Uh, he says, there's a general notion in C++ that standard attributes should be ignorable. However, currently there does not seem to be a common understanding of what, of what ignorable means. And this paper discusses what kind of ignorability is there, basically. Yeah, I think it could be useful if more attributes where to be introduced. Some other papers and user generated static assert messages. Oh, this one's interesting. Uh, P2169, a nice placeholder with no name. So this was yeah, approved. Yeah. yeah. The underscore is now, can now be used as a placeholder for variable declarations and pattern matching in a fully backward compatible manner. So this is for entities for which a name would provide no additional information, like in something unused, or if you have structured binding with one member um, unused, with one binding unused, you can use uh, underscore. Um, yeah, uh, strong Scala vibes. But, um, and Python. You know, and so Python. If you need more than one of these unnamed entities, I don't think you can use the same underscore twice in an expression or a binding, I guess. No, they say in revision one, they did make uh, use of underscore ill-formed once a placeholder has been declared in the same scope. So yeah, in the same scope, there's, they can be only one of those. Okay, so just as usual, it's a normal identifier. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, free function linear algebra interface based on BLAS was accepted for 26. This is P1673. This paper received consensus for further work. This is P2809. Trivial infinite loops are not undefined behavior. We discussed it previously and this is an existing problem. Uh, so yeah, apparently the committee agreed that it's a, it, it has to be dealt in some way, dealt with in some way. But apparently not like that. <laughs> so further work is, was encouraged. Of contracts, uh, there were uh, some papers, P2877, contract build mode, semantics and implement, implementation strategies, uh, which received con, uh, consensus. This is by Joshua Byrne and Tom Honeman. Can you remind me what was the consensus on side effects uh, in contracts? Uh, there shouldn't be any, I think. Are they <laughs> uh, not allowed by the compiler somehow? I think they were um, worrying about that. Uh, if there's a side effect um, on your head, be it. Um, there's much more worry on my side about you be in contract ev uh, expression evaluations, um, which they just say, well, it shouldn't happen. Um, but there they don't have control. The user has no effective control of that. Uh, whether I do something like uh, um, contract uh, expression and keep account of how many times the contract has been uh, executed. I don't see that as being particularly dangerous. It's the usual discussion between sort of purity of functions and functions that have been um, instrumented to, to give information about their execution. I tend to favor allowing that kind of stuff 
so that in, in, in interfaces are, are stable. Like what in a template function, what if in a template function I put some telemetry uh, code in there, do I have to change the interface to the function to uh, allow that to be done? I think the answer, the nice answer is no. Thank you. Um, so the paper about contract violation handler P2811 received consensus for. So that's, a, I suppose, a good uh, development. But another paper related to it, P2853, which proposed stud contract violation, was voted against. And the quote from uh, Reddit it goes like this. As a consequence, we removed the notion of build modes from the contract's MVP. Every contract annotation now has one of the following three semantics. Ignore, observe, enforce. And it is implementation defined which one you get. Further, we now have a consensus design for contract violation handling. So I guess that means that the problem of only having no eval and eval and abort modes is now solved. And they can proceed with uh, other things <laughs> because that, so that was one of the big correctly one. that uh, we will not have those two modes. We will have some sort of API to decide what is the behavior of the API is still to be defined. Nice. I think uh, it's implementation defined, so every um, implementation can do something or other. And uh, it's up to us poor users to figure out what the implementations do and how to write portable code. Um, I, I worry about this. We could, of course, hope that all the implementers agree on doing things the same way but such hopes have not always come true. Yeah, it does sound like something that, you know, instead of hope, uh, should be standardized. I don't know. Otherwise, it's truly, I mean, admitting we're not going to be able to port uh, very easily from GCC to client to MSVC. Mm. Maybe this will sort of unclog the pipes for the contract work because that was a big thing that needed to be decided, uh, those two modes. And now, because contracts are not anymore limited to those two build modes, they can proceed with implementation and other discussions and, and more bike shedding. I believe that the, the unclogging of the pipe was the reason for this. Uh, what I just said here, I also said in the committee, and I also warn that there are a couple of further um, stages of the process after the study group, uh, EWG, uh, LEWG, um, core, uh, library, and then plenary. Uh, this should be considered preliminary. Right. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so disappointments. Networking group didn't meet and uh, Redditors are saying just use ASIO. But on the other hand, Chris Kolhoff, according to them, stopped working with the committee. It looks like the networking rebase on senders receivers isn't happening, which is a pity. He used to like follow their progress and uh, kept rebasing networking TS on the latest developments, but apparently that is no more. Other disappointments were reflection. Uh, they just reviewed use cases and it now targets 29, but optimistic target is still 26. So <sighs> miracle can happen. And also pattern matching. There were no developments. And again, in the table, it's listed as targeting 
C++ 29, optimistically 26. Redditors are really hoping for reflection and pattern matching in 26. Now, there are some indirect signs that the work is ongoing. Like, for example, this placeholder proposal. Michael Park was one of the authors. And uh, uh, in the paper somewhere, if I can remind you of a small code snippet that's related to um, pattern matching. It goes like this. Inspect, parenthesis foo, curly braces, underscore, goes to with an arrow approximation bar. So it looks like this underscore thing was also part of the work to enable pattern matching, hopefully. Yeah, I don't know. That's just my speculation. Daniela Engert seems to think that as well. Uh, she posted on Mastodon, quote, the latest discussions regarding pattern matching can be found um, in the link provided. And the documents where the papers were pattern matching in general, do expressions, which is also related to pattern matching, and placeholders and un placeholder underscore paper. And she then uh, says, I think there's a good chance to complete pattern matching in 26. So it looks like all these uh, placeholder paper and do expressions could have been yak shaving for pattern matching. Uh, to remind you, yak shaving is, quote, what you are doing when you are doing something, some stupid fiddly little task that bears no obvious relationship to what you are supposed to be working on, but yet a chain of 12 casual relations links what you are doing to the original meta task. <laughs> I do a lot of yak shaving at work, so I'm very familiar with this term. Uh, right, there's a trip report from Herb Sutter, which basically says the same thing. Starting C++ 26, uh, core language features, and yeah. Uh, he mentions all these papers that we mentioned and we looked at. Oh yeah, the Redditors discussing his uh, post say, quote, what about networking? And Jonathan Müller says, that's essentially dead at the moment. Uh, why, someone asks? And another one replies, quote, because they dropped exe executors in favor of senders and receivers. The main proponent of networking, Chris Kolhoff, has quit spending his time with the committee and somebody else will have to reformulate the nets in terms of senders receivers, which is unfinished and devolving from paper to paper. I would count at least 10 years from now for it to happen, if at all, end quote. Another trip report from Jonathan Müller, uh, who now apparently works at ThinkCell. And yeah, he also, um, it's an interesting article, uh, an interesting post, um, quite, quite a short one, so not much to read. And from Reddit, there was someone who said, while reflection wasn't talked about at this meeting, I've heard rumors that there might be some movement soon. Another uh, paper that I forgot to mention that also was apparently discussed, a control flow operator. A new operator for C++? This can't be. But apparently it received some sort of encouragement, let's say that. This paper, uh, number P2561 by Barry Revzin, proposes an operator that helps those code bases that do not use exceptions and probably will not in the future. And uh, there is a, an equivalent operator in other languages which sort of helps unwrap uh, things like std expected and make the code easier to look at. I don't think in this I paper... This paper is very interesting. Yeah. And, uh, and there is a lot of... Uh... Uh, good points that this uh, paper makes. Uh, I'm, I'm worried though that a good chunk of the paper is dedicated to 
what should be the syntax because I can see this being back shedded till the next decade. Yeah, yeah, and the paper isn't proposing the exact uh, syntax. Uh, it just discusses uh, the possible variations, including various parts of the committee loves discussing new syntax for things. This one, if you get it, you can write code that is almost as simple and elegant as exception-based code, but only almost. Still, I think there is yeah. even a small table in the paper that uh, summarizes all the counterpoints to every single syntax. Yes. Yeah, this one, Somebody right? Says, I don't yeah. Like. Yes. <laughs> Question E, like E being the um, an instance for of static expected question e don't like the prefix try e or try question mark e don't like the prefix e three question marks <laughs> that's a bit all going a bit that, that overboard is, is a bit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and notes note triple question mark was the trigraph for question mark and looks ridiculous but at least doesn't conflict with other languages. Question mark, question mark. E, ex, e exclamation mark or E bang. Viable, but seems like the wrong punctuation for something that may or may not continue. E dot continue question mark. Viable and not completely terrible, but doesn't seem as nice as E dot try question mark. It's just thrown up in my mind. I think I've seen John Skeet talking about some new operators in C Sharp and they've introduced the bang or exclamation for some of the nullable things. And he's resorted to calling that the damn it operator, which I quite liked. <laughs> Sounds reasonable. And see the code that it's uh, generating into? <laughs> it hides complexity as opposed to uh, eliminate it. Yeah, this entire table uh, that provides listing of the code generated from these. Um, yeah. Uh, Let's uh, say that it's certainly not a zero overhead abstraction. It is an abstraction, but you pay out of the nose for it. Unless there's uh, something in the optimizer I haven't appreciated. We always have to take that into account. But there's conditionals in there. They're hard to optimize away. We have to count on the branch predictor here. I am surprised that they didn't suggest try exclamation mark, which I think it's, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, it's a combination that may be used in Rust. Uh, he does mention Rust, obviously. But yeah, I'm sure someone will mention it during the endless bike sharing sessions that will follow. Uh, but yeah, it does say there was a try exclamation mark macro in Rust. Yes, that's the one that I'm thinking about. Yeah, there's another uh, another report uh, from Bartomei Filipek. And there was a mailing list available before the Varna meeting. And uh, there were only several papers that caught my eye. Uh, this one... P2141, aggregates are named tuples. Basically, it um, argues that we should be, uh, should be able to use the standard uh, functionality for tuple with aggregates, like std get, the tuple element, and std tuple sized, uh, and so on, which I'm guessing could probably simplify some template meta programming. This paper, P25, uh, P2654, Macros and Standard Library Modules um, by Alistair Meredith. He says, C23 introduces the notion of library modules that export the whole content of the C standard library, except for any parts that are defined as macros. This paper reviews the library macros that are therefore not exported and looks for ways to export that same functionality without requiring the module's language feature to become aware of macros. So that kind of answers um, the previous question you had, Gianluca, about macros and modules. 
No. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Narrow contracts. This is related to uh, contracts, P2831 and others. Functions having a narrow contract should not be no except. Uh, this is so called Lakers rule, which is a long standing design principle in the C standard library. It stipulates that a function having a narrow contract should not be declared no except, even if it's known to not throw when called with valid input. In this paper, we demonstrate why the Lakers rule is still useful and important today and should not be removed, which sort of suggests that uh, someone wanted to remove it, uh, probably related to contract work. What is a narrow contract in this context? Uh, let me see. Oh, there you go. A function that has no preconditions on its input of values or on the state accessible from it i.e. a function that has defined a behavior for any combination of input values and accessible state is said to have a wide contract. Examples of such functions in the C++ standard library are std vector at and std vector size. If such a function is required to never throw an exception, it may be declared no except. By contrast, a function that has preconditions, i.e. a function whose behavior is undefined for some combination of input values and accessible state, uh, which we can call invalid, is said to have a narrow contract. Examples of such functions in the C++ standard library are studvector operator index uh, subscript and studvector front. Invoking the former with an out-of-bounds index or invoking either function on an empty vector will result in undefined behavior. So they stipulate that this should not be no except because there were there are situations um, where the uh, contract for those functions doesn't work makes sense the the main point is that if something has a narrow contract an error can happen inside it and you could write code to detect it in many cases and what do you do then if it's noted Seems logical. Uh, there was a Reddit post, status of reflection, someone asked. And the reply was, reflection is dead in the practical sense. No one's working on it. Andrew Sutton's P2237 paper is three years, three years old. The last paper about it is P2560 and is over a year old. The SG7 public email archive doesn't show any discussion in over a year. The Slack channel for it is on CPP. Lang hasn't had a message in almost two years. So it's not looking good. A slightly related post on Reddit. What C++ library do you wish existed, but hasn't been created yet? And somehow, because people can't actually read, apparently, most Redditors in this thread assumed it's about the standard library, which it wasn't. And all the comments went into the what had to be part of the standard library instead of just libraries. And so one of the first comments was, please give us a reflection. And this uh, caused an interesting discussion with um, some interesting comment from Jonathan Müller. Someone said to this, the meta classes are on their way, the C++ committee do take long to publish their final drafts, then finally standardization. Even then, it might take years for it to appear on a compiler. Look at the modules feature. And Jonathan replies, I don't know what you've heard, but meta classes absolutely aren't on their way. <laughs> and uh, the initial poster uh, replies, it looks like they've stalled over the last few years, but even if it takes another 10, at least they are having discussions on them. And Jonathan continues, We aren't. It's been discussed once in SG7 for 15 minutes, four years ago. And then he says, quote, Herb has a tendency to give grand talks about features the committee has never seen before and frames them as if they are the next big thing of C++, end quote. I like that Jonathan doesn't hold any punches. <laughs> no, he doesn't. 
doesn't Oof. some of some of the suggestions went uh, like we need solid utf8 strings functions in the standard library it's insane to not have that in this day and age which is fair but uh, as far as i know some work is ongoing that uh, software ieee 754 decimal floats as opposed to float floats so that would be good uh, for you know counting Binary. money rather than decimal i think oh yeah yeah, yeah. maybe you're right yes yeah. yes of course so decimal floats would be good for counting money modern cross-platform native ui library well that's not going to happen uh, and uh, someone wished for a library for mapping subclassing enums in some in some way um, in the absence of reflection uh, most people suggested magic enum uh, which we use at work, and it's working pretty pretty well. And there will be a, a link to a blog post explaining what is the magic behind the magic in him. And uh, someone wished for a library like Python's URL lib for easy construction of um, internet URL requests. And apparently there is such a thing. It's called CPR. And it's called C++ requests, curl for people, a spiritual port of Python requests. And it's a wrapper around libcurl uh, with a very nice interface, uh, which basically lets you quickly shoot all kinds of HTTP and other requests without too much hassle. It's very good. It's very good. Yeah. If we had a little bit more time I was sort of going to talk about this presentation uh, during ACCU conference recently, which was called C++ and Beyond Discussion, Vittorio Romeo, Kevin Henney, Nico Yosotis, and Kate Gregory. And um, yeah, I had many quotes from it, but looks like I'll have to postpone it um, till the next meeting. And... Uh, today to finish off i'll show you this article it's pretty old it's from 2010 but it doesn't make it less funny uh, it's from the register and uh, here's a quote from it between 1969 and 1973 ken thompson created unix with dennis ritchie at the same time he also developed the c language the speed and simplicity of C helped Unix spread widely. Both have subsequently become quite popular. Google hired Thompson to create a new language Go. But Google also requires all of its recruits to pass a language test. According to Thompson, he hasn't quite got around to it yet, and so can't submit code. And this is a quote from the book Coders at Work, which is like Q&A session with him. Question. I know Google has a policy where every new employee has to get checked out on languages before they are allowed to check code in, which means you had to get checked out on C, which you co-created. Thompson, yeah, I haven't been. Question, you haven't been? You're not allowed to check in code? Thompson, I'm not allowed to check in code, no. I just haven't done it. I've so far found no need to. <laughs> funny, very funny. I hope... You, Bjarne, didn't have to <laughs> get tested on C++. Well, I haven't applied to Google. Fair enough. I think they would be the and, only and, and one. By the way, and by the way, in the bank, I never checked in code because I don't think people who aren't full-time uh, developers doing it really a lot should check in code. Um, I can talk to somebody and they can help me, but if 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 you're not doing it on a daily basis on a particular code base you're dealing with, uh, you, you are a bit of an amateur and you can make stupid mistakes. Fair enough. Maybe that's uh, mm -hmm. why Thompson also... There's a certain amount of professionalism and uh, that, that takes experience and, and continuous practice. Maybe that's why he also didn't have the need to 
to commit but any Ken fraud. doesn't feel the need to explain. <laughs> also that, yeah. And finally, the down to operator, if you didn't know which is available in C++. Uh, this is a post on Mastodon from Love Game, who says, does anyone else use the C slash C++ down to operator, unironically, or is it just me? And the code snippet is a while loop. And there's a while, parenthesis, size, dash, dash, greater than, zero. Which kind of looks like a, a, an arrow operator, uh, suggesting size decreases uh, towards zero. If size is uh, suitably defined by the right type, you can make that work. Um, I, I played with uh, the star star operator for exponentiation. It, it works beautifully, provided the argument actually is something for, for which star and is uh, defined suitably. But the yeah. point is, combinations of uh, operators can and be made to do just about anything. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for coming, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Club.